A couple of videos ago, I walked you through all of the parts I chose for this $700 gaming PC build, and I covered why I chose each part. And in my last video, I assembled the system. In this video, I'm going to go over what it was like to build the system, as well as show you how it benchmarked in a handful of games at both 1080p and 1440p resolution. I'll also show you what kind of thermals you'll be looking at if you were to build the same system. Now, one of the components in this build has gone out of stock, and so there is a change you'll have to make if you want to build this PC or something similar to it. But first, before we get into all of that, let's jump into how the build process went. This was about as straightforward of a build as you'll get with a new PC build, with the one exception being how the Fractal Design Pop Mini Air Case handled connecting both the fans and the RGB lighting on the fans, but we'll get to that in a second. For the build, it was the standard take off all of the case's panels, mount the power supply, set the IO shield on the back panel of the case, install the CPU, memory, SSD, and cooler on the motherboard, drop the motherboard into the case and mount it, connect the motherboard power connection, CPU power connection, front panel connectors, and fans, and then install the graphics card and connect the PCIe power connection to it. Everything went smoothly in the build, but again, I did run into a bit of confusion on how the fans and RGB lights were supposed to be connected, but that was only mainly because I didn't look at the manual. Basically, all of the fans can either be connected to the motherboard individually, or they can all be daisy-chained together. Each fan's cable has a daisy-chained header coming off of it, so you can string them all together. The same is true for the RGB connection for each fan. You'll need to daisy-chain all of the RGB connections together, and then you can either connect it to your motherboard so that you can control your RGB lights with the RGB software that comes on your motherboard, or you can connect it to this 3-pin connector on your case, and connecting it here will allow you to use the RGB button on the front panel to cycle through a variety of presets. I ended up connecting it to my motherboard so that I can control the RGB lighting through the motherboard software, but if you want an easy, all but more limited way to control your RGB lights, you can just connect it to the case. Ultimately though, I like building inside of the Fractal Design Pot Mini Air. It's just a $60 case, but it looks really nice. It offers a ton of room, and as you'll see in a moment, it offers solid out-of-the-box thermals. I do wish that instead of forcing you to use daisy chain connections that Fractal just included either three-way fan and ARGB splitters or a fan and RGB controller. I realize that you can't have everything on a budget-friendly case, but the Okinos Aqua 3 I used in a different build is also a $60 case, and it came with an ARGB controller pre-installed and a three-way fan splitter to handle all of the fan connections. Either way, it was a minor inconvenience and not really a deal breaker considering everything the Pop Mini Air offers. I will do a full review on this case in the near future, and the verdict of that review will be that it is an amazing case for the price it comes in at. Overall though, the build process for this set of components was very easy, and even a beginner would have no problems putting this system together. So with that being said, let's get into the benchmarks and go over how this build performed. I tested this build and the combination of the Intel Core i5-12400F and the RX 6700 XT in seven different games at both 1080p and 1440p resolution. I tested this system in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, Cyberpunk 2077, Metro Exodus, Red Dead Redemption 2, Starfield, and Talos Principle 2. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the system was able to average nearly 90 frames per second on average at the ultra-high preset, with 1% lows of 58 frames per second. So overall, a pretty good frame rate for Valhalla at 1440p resolution. At 1080p, the game did go well over 100 frames per second at the ultra-high preset, averaging 117 frames per second at the highest setting, with 1% lows of 73 frames per second. So definitely a high enough average frame rate to where you could utilize a higher refresh rate monitor for Assassin's Creed Valhalla at 1080p resolution. In the very demanding Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, the combination of the i5-12400F and RX 6700 XT were only able to average 51 frames per second at the Ultra preset at 1440p resolution. So not the greatest experience maxed out for Avatar at 1440p, and if you do want to use this setup to game at 2K resolution, and you want to play Frontiers of Pandora, you'll need to turn some settings down to hit a playable frame rate. By turning the settings down to high or medium, the system was able to average over 60 frames per second, and the game still looked good enough to enjoy it. Even at 1080p, the 12400F and 6700XT could barely manage to average over 60 frames per second on the Ultra preset, but it was able to average 67 frames per second with 1% lows of 53 frames per second. So this system won't offer extreme performance in Frontiers of Pandora, but definitely good enough to enjoy the game at either 1080p or 1440p resolution. In Cyberpunk 2077, I tested this setup at the ray tracing overdrive 
Ray Tracing Ultra, Ray Tracing Medium, Ultra, High, and Medium presets. I've built a number of AMD-based builds over the past six months, and none of them have handled Cyberpunk's ray tracing settings well, and the same is true for the RX 6700 XT. At 1440p resolution, the Ray Tracing Overdrive and Ray Tracing Ultra presets are basically unplayable, with the 12400F and 6700XT only able to eke out an average frame rate of just 15 frames per second and 36 frames per second, respectively. The setup did handle the Ray Tracing Medium setting a bit better, but at just 45 frames per second on average, it really won't provide a good enough experience there either. But if you're willing to play at the ultra or high non-ray tracing settings, the experience in Cyberpunk is much better. The system was able to average 70 frames per second at the ultra preset and 97 frames per second on the high preset. At 1080p resolution, the system again couldn't handle the overdrive and ultra ray tracing presets, but it was able to hit nearly 60 frames per second at the ray tracing medium setting, so you could feasibly play at that preset and get okay performance. However, the setup was able to deliver a more than 100 frame per second experience at the ultra non-ray tracing preset, and so at 1080p you can achieve a near ideal experience with the 12400F and RX 6700 XT in Cyberpunk. Metro Exodus is another extremely difficult game to run fully maxed out, both at 1080p and 1440p resolution. And although the 12400F and 6700XT are a very powerful combination, even they aren't strong enough to run the game anywhere close to 60 frames per second, either at 1080p or 1440p resolution. In fact, at 1440p resolution and at the extreme preset, the 6700XT was only able to average 31 frames per second with 1% lows of 24 frames per second. At the high preset though, the system was able to hit 61 frames per second on average with 1% lows of 43 frames per second. So the 6700XT can still run at Metro Exodus at 2K resolution if you're willing to turn a few settings down. At 1080p resolution, the 6700XT fared a little better at the extreme preset, averaging 43 frames per second with 1% lows of 31 frames per second, but that's not a high enough average frame rate to justify the better graphic settings. Turning down the settings to the Ultra preset, the 6700XT was able to average 70 frames per second with 1% lows of 44 frames per second, and at the high preset, the system was able to achieve a very comfortable 91 frames per second with 1% lows of 55 frames per second. So even though Metro Exodus is extremely taxing to run, and you won't get the greatest results at 1440p resolution, this $700 PC build was able to handle it well enough by just turning the settings down a little bit. I also tested this system in Red Dead Redemption 2 at the ultra high, medium, and low settings. Note that in Red Dead Redemption 2, AMD's FSR is enabled by default, and so we left it on for our tests. At the Ultra preset with FSR turned on, the combination of the i5-12400F and RX 6700XT performed very well, averaging 77 frames per second at 1440p resolution with 1% lows of 58 frames per second. If you're looking to run the game on a 1440p high refresh rate display, this setup can do that fairly well if you're willing to turn the settings down just a bit, as it averaged 114 frames per second at the high settings. At 1080p resolution, the game ran very well, averaging 91 frames per second at the ultra preset and 133 frames per second at the high preset. So while Red Dead features incredible graphics, the i5-12400F and RX 6700XT are powerful enough to handle it with no problems. Again though, that is with AMD's FSR enabled by default. In Starfield, I tested the system at the ultra high and medium presets and also at the ultra and high presets with frame generation turned on. I discovered the frame generation setting a while back and it really helps boost performance in the game as you can see in these benchmarks. At the ultra preset at 1440p resolution with frame generation turned off, our system was only able to average 51 frames per second with 1% lows of 37 frames per second. But with frame generation turned on, the system averaged 90 frames per second with 1% lows of 76 frames per second. At 1080p resolution without frame generation turned on, the system averaged 60 frames per second at the ultra preset with 1% lows of 49 frames per second. But at 1080p with frame generation turned on, it was able to average 107 frames per second with 1% lows of 87 frames per second. So despite Starfield being considered to be extremely difficult to run, with the frame generation option turned on, our system was able to achieve good results. I personally didn't notice a big difference in the quality of the graphics with frame generation on, but perhaps someone who has an eye for details would see something different. Either way, even with frame generation turned off, you can still hit around 70 frames per second on the high setting at 1080p resolution and around 60 frames per second on the high setting at 1440p resolution. So the system will be able to run this game whether you turn on frame gen or not, 
but you'll get much better results when using it. I also tested the build in Talos Principle 2, which at the Ultra preset is very demanding to run. At 1440p resolution at the Ultra preset, our system was only able to average 35 frames per second with 1% lows of 18 frames per second. You get a significant jump in performance when you drop down to the high setting though, as the system averaged 83 frames per second there with 1% lows of 52 frames per second. At 1080p resolution at the Ultra preset, the system averaged 53 frames per second. Dropping down to the high setting netted us 106 frames per second on average with 1% lows of 64 frames per second. It should be noted that the seven games I used for this benchmark are all relatively demanding titles. So while you might not be impressed with some of the benchmarks this build put out, just remember that those games are on the more extreme side of the spectrum. This build will easily be able to handle popular games like Minecraft, Valorant, Call of Duty, Fortnite, League of Legends, etc. Overall though, for just $700 you get a build that can run just about anything maxed out at 1080p resolution and basically anything on at least higher settings at 1440p resolution. That's pretty good for such a low budget. For thermals, I stress tested the system in Cinebench's multi-core CPU test, and I also tracked the GPU temperature in Metro Exodus's benchmark tool. Under full load, the Intel Core i5-12400F never exceeded 60 degrees Celsius. The i5-12400F doesn't run hot either way, and I could have just stuck with the stock cooler for this build. But Intel's stock cooler is loud, and it isn't that great from an aesthetic standpoint, although the new design is 100 times better than the old Intel stock cooler design. But I'm happy with the $16 ID cooling cooler I chose for this build. It keeps the 12400F cooler than the stock cooler would have, and it operates much more quietly too. In Metro Exodus's benchmark tool under full load, the XFX Swift 309 RX 6700 XT never went much above 70 degrees, which is well within operating temperatures. So overall, the stock cooling configuration that the Fractal Design Pop Mini Air comes with, combined with the ID cooling cooler, helped deliver above average thermals and that seems like a win for such a low-budget build, especially since we really spent a good portion of our budget on the GPU. The only problem with this build and how I have it configured is that one of the parts I chose is no longer in stock, and unfortunately that part is the XFX Swift 309 RX 6700 XT, basically the main component in this build. To make it worse, there aren't any other RX 6700 XTs available on any other retailers, that's Amazon, Newegg, or BH and Photo and Video, but there are some refurbished RX 6700 XT options on Amazon. However, I was able to get the XFX RX 6700 XT for $290, but even the refurbished options that are currently available on Amazon right now are going for about $300. There is an RX 6750 XT from PowerColor that's available right now for about $300, so that's only $10 more than what we paid for the 6700 XT, and that would give you even better performance. Now I used a 6750 XT in an $800 build I did recently, and you can check our review on that card to see how it benchmarked, and then you can decide if it would be worth it for you to stretch your budget to get it for this build. But we already went quite a bit over budget on this $700 build, and the 6750 XT will only add to that. So if you're looking to stay closer to $700, the real only way to do that would be to drop down to something like an RX 7600 for about $250. The 7600 is going to lag behind the 6700 XT quite a bit in performance, especially at 1440p resolution, and because it only comes with 8GB of VRAM, it may not hold up as well in the future as new games get developed to utilize more VRAM. If it were me and I couldn't find the 6700 XT available for a lower price, I'd definitely stretch my budget and get the 6750 XT. Ultimately though, there's a lot you can do with the $700 to $750 budget when building a gaming PC. As you can see from the benchmarks, 1440p gaming is not out of the question in this price range. And remember, the games I chose to benchmark represent the more demanding side of games as well. Most of today's popular titles will run similarly or even better than the games I benchmarked. Obviously, if you need a monitor and peripherals, your total price will be much higher than $700, but I hope this video or any of my other videos have shown you what kind of system you can build with just a moderate budget. If you are interested in building this PC or something similar to it, I've left all of the links to these parts in the description below. Those are affiliate links and if you purchase through those, I might earn a small commission, which of course greatly helps my channel out and any support is greatly appreciated. But that does it for this video. I will be following up with some individual reviews on some of the components I use in this build and I'm hoping to get a bigger benchmark done on the i5-12400F and RX 6700 XT combo.
So if you're interested in those, definitely stay tuned. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.